turn it up a bit. Them bells. Just point it towards the church. It's, it's all right, guys. Madeline Kinlan, who was she? Well, we know she was a kind and generous lady who, with her brother Leo, spent many happy days here on Holy Island of Lindisfarne and the local area. As the adventurer, Madeline travelled to the Americas, shunning hotels by staying with the locals and really getting to know them, and their different and exciting cultures. Madeline even stayed in Machu Picchu in Peru at one point, but wherever she travelled to or wherever she went, she always encountered goodwill, generosity and kindness. The same qualities that she gave out herself in abundance. Madeline was driven by a strong sense of ambition. She inspired others with her love of innovation and always strived to help those in need in society. She was never afraid to stand up for what she knew was right, even if it did upset some. She sounded like a really special lady. Solitude and isolation suit many people, but what if this lifestyle doesn't suit you and you find yourself longing for life over on the mainland? How do people cope on this far-flung part of Northumberland? Well, I enjoy it. I know that there are some people who find it difficult. Uh, there are people who come to live on the island and only stick a couple of years. If they stay more than two years, then they're settled. But a lot of people find that two years is enough and they're ready for going away again. When I first came here, somebody said to me, it's like, Mom, I either love it or you hate it. And I totally agree with that statement, because it is. You either just gel with the island or you just, you're here a week and you're gone. And for me... I was 19 when I came here, and it works. But it's not for everyone. But I, uh, I spend a lot of time on the computer, I read, I do crosswords, I enjoy cooking, so I'm, you know, pretty good at keeping myself well fed. If you're set in your ways and you won't get on, do you know what I mean? I don't know, it took me about two or three years to speak to anybody, really. I was told to keep my mouth shut and uh, see how you get on, and it worked for me. But it's, I don't know, if you come here and try and change things, it doesn't work. Isolation, 
Well, it is a problem for some people, it isn't for me. Uh, but we are cut off, we're cut off by the tides, obviously, as you know, the tides, the tides are, we're an island for approximately 10 hours a day, two five hour stretches, so we're an island, so when the tides and we're isolated, obviously. I don't go out at all now, except once a week I go up to the post office to pick up a Saturday paper, but... Um, I don't feel it as solitude, um, I feel it as uh, peacefulness. Mm -hmm. It's not for everyone's cup of tea. And then the, I don't know, people say it's a close community and hard to get into, but if you if you open to anything, I'm sure anybody would get on. <laughs> a lot of the things that the island disagrees with are being imposed by people on the mainland who really don't know the island. But unfortunately, there is also a trend now for... A, for the incomers who have newly arrived not to understand the island and they too are wanting changes made which are not going in the way the island might have liked to go. I'm never sad on Lonely Island, I love it, but I don't know, I think it's great. <laughs> There's nothing really sad about life, I, don't, I just love it, yeah. I've only been here 14 years and you've had, we've had a lot of people in that time come and try and change a lot of things and it just doesn't work. Things that don't need to be changed. <laughs> um, but then it's quite nice when the tide comes in and uh, we'll get nice and peaceful and quiet and, uh, and I suppose I like it like that. I think the number of people who come and don't know what they're coming to and are disappointed because the island isn't what they expected. In the tourist season brings a lot of... in the island wouldn't run without them really, I mean... It's bliss when the tide's up. <laughs> it's also nice to have them here because it keeps uh, shops going and people that live here have jobs because of them. When I was a kid we used to go onto the island and we used to see the McGregors, we used to have the local post office uh, and I know they they moved because of ill health and things like that off the island. You know, the girls actually one of them works locally now. Um, but yes, they they moved off the island, and uh, again, they still support us. You know, it's, it's lovely that they never forget. You know, the island's got so many links to the area. You know, I mean, it links in with sea, all up the coast. Um, we have a we bought a house and the gentleman used to have the pub on Holy Island, uh, Frank Gregory, and he moved off the island. He retired, you know, and it's just so many interlinks that the island has. It just has so many pieces coming off it, and it works in with the area so much, you know. So people went to visit Holy Island, and there's a very special lady went to see Holy Island. Mm -hmm. Do you know who that is? Mm -hmm. That's the Queen. The Queen? The Queen. No, the Queen yeah, went yeah. there. Yeah. See that date? 29th of June, 1958. She came to Holy Island with her husband, Prince Philip. These are some of the people Stop that came. Us. Look, look, there's a scout. Look, they've all brought their picnics. They're there for the day. I don't know if you're going to take a picnic when you're over. And now she's in that market square. We saw it originally with a horse cart. And she's going to plant a tree. Oh, we'll have to look for the right, tree. she and Prince Philip both planted trees there, and I think they are still there. This is the tree that she planted oh. back in 1958. Oh, so so that is how many years ago? Oh, 60, nearly 64 years ago. Uh, I can remember the island, I was just a boy then, the island before the causeway. The causeway came in 1954, but before that we used to, people had to get here just across the sands. It used to be horse and cart, but then in the, the late 40s and 50s it was um, old Model T Fords with the nice high cars that could get through the water and across the sand. Yeah? So you're taking me back here now when I was starting to, <laughs> all them years. These are the different ways that they used to get across to the Holy Island, Holy Island oh, in a horse and cart going through the water. She said, we liked the trap best because we sat facing one another at the back and could look over the horse's back towards the island. 
She said, we were greeted by our old friends at the station, the railway station. So Beale, there was actually a railway station at Beale, where you turn off the A1. Um, and I was a postman for 42 years. I retired in 2010. Um, when I first started, actually, the, the trains stopped at Beale. We used to get the, pick the mail from the trains at Beale. Steam trains, them days. So... That wasn't very safe, so what they decided to do was build a causeway. This is them opening the causeway. This, this lady, the Duchess of Northumberland, came in August 1954 to open the causeway. Now, the Duchess of Northumberland was in this van. You know she was. When, when she came she? across, yeah. That so this, so this is the one that came, the first one that came across to the island. It's early morning on Friday the 26th of November. As the sun comes up, it casts shadows on this calm and peaceful island. Illuminating the sand and the many dwellings, the very fabric of this isolated community. Then, and I understand there were a lot of tiles off roofs, there were a lot of chimneys damaged, there were guttering and aerials all needed repair. Uh, storm, storm Island was in November, that was three day power cut I think. The final days of November prove a disastrous time for the island as 90 miles an hour winds batter the coastline, causing damage to many parts of the area. I was very fortunate my house stood firm, no bother at all, nothing, but the gardens are a wreck. Mm. Uh, the glass from my greenhouse was in my neighbour's garden and another garden down the road. <laughs> and there's uh, broken glass all over the place now and the framework is actually twisted and contorted out of shape. It'll never go back together again. You couldn't just say, oh, put the glass back in. It's, it's dead. Uh, these are the ones just inshore that got... Just took them all out because it's pointless. I'm not catching anything more holes in them. <laughs> all this rope that I'm putting on gets rubbed off and all the fleets had moved a mile south with the wind. Right. I think it must be dozens of a couple of dozen of us have generators. So that's quite handy. But then you have to help the ones that don't. And everybody's scratching about for gas and things. I think everybody across the North East was the same then though. Even the sand resembles a lunar landscape, with craters now sunk into the seabed. But for some, it's business as usual. The causeway has suffered a lot of damage. 
Huge potholes in the tarmac have been gouged out by the ferocious waves. Signage and posts ripped out and the refuge box decimated. Now under repair, the small cabin is supported by makeshift scaffolding. As the weeks roll on, repairs to the causeway are carried out and supplies maintained. Yet again, this small Northumbrian island has literally weathered the storm. I think a lot of fishermen up and down the coast lost all the fishing gear. So, I don't know. It was quite hard to find them all, to be honest. It took weeks. I'm heading up to Osborne's Fort now. I'm making sure I'm wrapped up extra warm. It's freezing cold here today on Holy Island. But on the way up to Osborne's Fort, I just have to share this view with you. The sun, the December sun, and the view out here, it's absolutely beautiful. This is Osborne's Fort and it was built during a rather uneasy time here on Holy Island in 1671. It was built to keep out the Dutch invaders. to the harbour on Holy Island now and this was once the central hub of the fishing community here but I wonder if that still is relevant today. I've been fishing with Paul, Paul Douglas for 10 years now and basically if you're a male you're a fisherman if you're female you work in a cafe. <laughs> we go six days a week weather permitted when we're not fishing we're mending creels <laughs> in this shed <laughs> so we just catch crabs and lobsters. Uh, used to catch salmon, but not allowed at the moment. So it's good, good way of life. Yeah. Tiring, but <laughs> yeah. The name itself speaks for itself. It sells itself. Absolutely. But it's been here. I love the place so much that I don't just come and visit myself. I bring ladies along with me on my women's retreats that I run in the locality of Northumberland. Yeah. But I always pay a visit with them, ladies, into Holy Island. Yeah. We go into the Gospel Garden. We meditate. I have the ladies doing some creative writing with the inspiration that comes from the sheer elegance and essence of purity of spirituality. I'm in Gospel Gardens and this has to be my favourite place on the whole of Holy Island. I love it here. Every time I visit, I have to stop by here as I have done today. The peacefulness and the tranquility that you can feel here, you can experience that every day of the year. And it really, really is such a special, almost spiritual place. I'm sure this is a place Madeline would have loved. I 
I was speaking to Angela Noble earlier on, who was a tribal belly dance uh, teacher, and she who also loves the island, and she says she feels it here in her heart. Yes. And I can I can see that as well, and I can feel that as well. Is that how you feel about about here as well? Do you know all of my it's senses so are on fire yeah. when I come to Holy Island? The excitement bubbles up just as I pass Bambara, and it's hitting that causeway. There's something very pilgrimage about the mm -hmm. crossing of that causeway the excitement of being able to you know the the whole pathway has been opened up for us to cross mm -hmm. and then once we get across there's that kind of oh can yeah. i get back across and am i in time for the time of zones yeah. before the tides start to come back in so basically the island opens itself up to us as we come here all of our chakras open but for me it's the sacral chakra because that's mm -hmm. that deep connection to the earth Earth, yep. to the history and all of the millions of people who've walked and enjoyed with their families, all of the memories that they've brought together and all of the memories that they've taken away. We do do funerals here. One of the wonderful things about being a parish church in a village is that you're the heart of the village and it's a real privilege to have all the community come together to say goodbye to somebody that's been very, very special and, um, and who they love. John was brought up in Sheffield. His father was a railway man. He first saw this island in, in the 50s. He saw the island and thought it looked an interesting place, but did know more about it. Then within a year, a good friend of his got in touch and said, I've just found a marvelous book about an island called Lindisfarne, full of birds. I'm sure you would love it. Brought their friends. Gradually these groups grew bigger and naturally became bird-watching groups. John thought, well, uh, uh, it would be nice to have a base up there so that we had somewhere to take these people when they wanted to come. Uh, one weekend he was staying in the Lindisfarne and somebody said to him that Castle View was for sale and he decided, that's for me. Mainly for the sake of his friends, so that there was somewhere for them all to come when they wanted to come and spend time with the birds on the island. I think John wanted to spread the message of the island. Although John is no longer with us, he along with Andy have left a lasting legacy in the form of a film archive documenting life at a particular time on the island. Unfortunately Andy passed away long before they got the project finished. I'm sure Dorothy's memories will resonate with a lot of people, but I wonder what life is like for the permanent resident here as opposed to a visitor. The total population is about 150, so we don't have any uh, unemployment. Um, Self-sufficient, I'm sure it pays its way. I'm sure Holy Island is a, as a, a boon to the rest of Northumberland because, as you've probably well aware of that the amount of tourists we get and they don't just come to Holy Island but they'll I think it's Holy Island is a bit like maybe Annick Castle, Bambra, Berwick, Sea Houses, Farn Islands. It's um a big tourist attraction, huge tourist attraction. I would say Holy Island is the main tourist attraction in Northumberland. Neville Heron. We get a lot of visitors here from all over the place on Holy Island that are not particularly country folk. They walk the nearest tracks and when it comes to a bit of mud, they go round it and it gets wider and wider and wider. And in the case of Holy Island, there isn't a square foot that hasn't got a, a beautiful plant growing out of it. And they're tending to erode a lot of the orchids and, and so on. It really needs for the footpaths to be more directional where you get things like the duck boards and things like that and the sign input more better in to keep the visitors in, in certain tracks so it only erodes a certain amount. What's going on out there in the world is, is sometimes horrifying. Um, 
a return to the peace and serenity that they used to be on there. It looks serene. I mean, the people who are wandering up and down there, they're enjoying what they're doing. Pollution's probably the only thing I would... You go along the beaches here, yeah, there's a lot of rubbish. But we're trying to do big clean cleanups at the minute for that. You probably see if you go through the dunes, there's big piles of it that parties have collected. But can't complain much, really. <laughs> So we must, Holy Island must bring financial good stuff for the rest of Northumberland. I hope Northumberland County Council has realised this, which I don't know whether to do or not. But the County Council has no understanding of this island. I mean, we have constant arguments with them. They're always putting up petitions for this, that and the other. And I think we need, Holy Island needs support. And I think a lot of... Powers that be, i.e. Northumberland County Council, think, oh, Holy Island, you've got to get on and just get on there and does fine. But we really could do with some help because the tourism is mega now and really we're becoming saturated. John and I lived on the corner of this island for 20-odd years and although we knew everybody and chatted with everybody, I would never say that we were really close, and we certainly were never islanders. I don't feel as if I'm an islander today, even after all these yeah. years. What is a holy islander? Good question. Well, you've got to be living here, I think, to start with. Um, well, different people have got different ideas of what an islander is. But I think you've really, really basically, I think it's if you've sort of... If it's your home, you can call yourself here, yeah, I'm, I'm an islander. Um, you've also got people who would say, well, were you born on the island? If you were born on your island, you're an, you're an islander. But if, if someone has moved here and they live here and put their hearts into the island, then, yeah, of course, you can, I think you can call themselves an islander. Because yeah? when we've come here to Holy Island, it, it's a, it's a harder water because it's Northumbrian water and it's from the water tank just nearby. Uh, and when we do the what when we make the tea here, you, you nearly only need to dip it in and out. It's a bit like the mother-in-laws at York. You only need to dip it in and out, and you get a nice strong cup of tea. But tea bag could probably do twice, three times. When we do the washing here, we don't do it very often. But when you do the washing here and you put the conditioner stuff in, all the stuff comes out smelling absolutely beautiful, and you can smell the conditioner and everything. And I thought, so that's learned to summer. So when we go back home, I'm going to turn the mains off and put the spring water on. Uh, and see if that, that, that's, I'm pretty sure that'll be it and it'll make it smell really, really nice. So we've get, we've gained some and learned some from that. Walking around Berwick, I visited many establishments that do good work in the town, like this one who support vulnerable people in the area. The main activities, well, is, is some people just like a general chat and the company, um, but we do try to encourage them 
to go out. Uh, a lot of them have fears about going out and mixing with other people. Now, if they're in the group and going out, they seem to be a lot more comfortable. It's just an all-round good group. I worked in mental health down in um, down in Yorkshire. I worked with people with um, Alzheimer's, but I've also experienced mental health myself. I've experienced depression. Yeah, I think there's a need for these organisations, volunteer-based. There's a need all over the place. Also, lots of groups we could maybe signpost to people, help with the cost of living and things like that. That's another thing that we could maybe have people come in and, you know, help you with your energy bills and things, hopefully. It's hard at the moment. And I think because of that, it could affect people's mental health. But if we're not able to advise somebody, the next step for us is to tell them to go along the citizens' advice and what questions to ask up there, to tell them what to say. They can get in touch with myself. Um, we have a website, um, Northern Spirit Berwick. We've also got a Facebook page. We will always make you welcome and hopefully make you feel comfortable. And whether you want to come back again, it's just entirely up to you. But we'd always hope that you would. Come along, see what it's like, see if it's going to interest you. It's February and I'm back on the island on a very special mission. I've decided to help out at the food bank over in Berwick, so whilst I'm here on the island shopping, I thought I'd take a few donations along. Use of the food bank is going up. Um, and we expect it to go up even more with uh, the climate as it is at the moment with people's finances. Um, so it is very well used, it's very well supported. I think that's me sorted with things to take across to the food bank. And whilst I was inside a first class post office over here, Peter and Bex Naylor, the owners of the store, have kindly donated more things for me to take across to the food bank in Berwick. In the food bank, it's all volunteers who help us with picking up donations from the drop-off points at supermarkets, sorting the food out and making up food parcels. We also have a couple of volunteers that deliver. So if we've got people that can't get to us or can't get a lift to pick food up, they'll go out and deliver for them. At the food bank, I stock the shelves with the food and make food parcels to the community. I got into it because I'm doing my Duke of Edinburgh award. I, I am a very proud parent. Um, she always gets me roped into all sorts of things, but, you know, the Duke of Edinburgh, has a, it's a great thing to have on your CV and to see a young person, you know, wanting to get involved in the community, it's, you know, it's great. We get donations from Holy Island, um, but we also have supported people in Holy Island before. Well, I think that should do. I'm going to head back on over to the mainland and up to Berwick. So my role here is I'm the operations director. So I'm responsible for all of the day-to-day -day running and report back to the board of trustees. So we have a small team of staff and everything that goes on here. We employ some staff at the childcare centre, so they're also my responsibility. So yeah, it's just to keep everything running and ticking along and making sure that new projects and ideas are raised and run with where possible.
During my volunteering at the food bank, I became aware of just how important this facility is for the whole community. So I've worked with charities for roughly 20 years, all community based, and it, the buzz you get out of, just that one moment when you know you've made a difference, to, to, to one person, never mind however many people, it's just phenomenal, it is phenomenal. Way back in Berwick-upon-Tweed's past, people were impoverished in many ways. But I was born in West Street in Berwick. Now this goes, obviously, in the end of the 1920s, and the place was still slum-ridden. Every, most of the folk here seemed, unless you had a lot of money, everybody lived up the yards. We had a luxury place, we had one big room, a little kitchen and a little bedroom. And initially an outside toilet, but we did get an inside toilet later on. And of course we had the luxury of a central heating when we had a bath. The bath was a tin bath. In the winter time, you put it in the kitchen and you open the gas oven door and you lit the oven. And you had central heating, so it was nice. And then you could go and get yourselves right in front of the fire. But, I mean, living conditions there were... Well, they were, they were normal to us. Everybody was in the same situation. So many people lived in one room or two rooms and with little or no in the way of facilities. Some were worse than others. I mean, I can remember the first slum clearance in Berwick, which was Weatherly Square and Narrow Lane, and they were moved into Blakewell Gardens. There was a slum clearance prior to that, which went to Tweedmouth, and the folk were not used to some of these features like baths, so we kn I know that somebody kept the pony in the bath, and somebody else kept the coal in the bath. You know, I think why a lot of uh, people from foreign climes come to live here, such as the Polish community and some others, I think it's the red roofs, the way it lies um, at the mouth of a big river. Yeah. Uh, it sort of draws them. They see it, you know, and they think it's like a bit like the, where they came from, such places like Dubrovnik and places like that do look a little, there's a little of that around, because yeah, red roofs are not, there's not a plethora of red roofs in England, but here, it just has that feeling. And when you look across from where I live in Tweedmouth, and you see those, the key walls and all the old houses, the Georgian with the red roofs and, it, and the guild hall standing up with its long spire, high spire, it's... It's a no-brainer, isn't it, really? You, you've got to look like that. So I think that draws them. The, the people who used to come to the island knew what the island was and what it had to offer and appreciated what was here and loved being here. And that showed in the number of people who still come back and stay with me long after they're capable of walking up into the dunes. Memories of our loved ones can be our most treasured possessions and what better way to remember them than by dedicating a small resting place in their name.
dotted around the island pay tribute to people who loved this place. Small plaques bear the names of family members, friends and loved ones now sadly missed. But whose presence and heart will always be part of this very special island. I asked Richard Patterson about friends and relatives he had lost from the island over the years. Dozens. And I'm not going to see any more than that, but um, if you think, I can remember for 70 years. Um, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say anything like that. We formed the Development Trust in 1995, 1996, a good few years ago now, um, to try to address the problem of housing island people, because there was a problem, young families getting housing, because when a property comes up for sale on the island, we were finding that the prices were too expensive. Most of them were bought for holiday homes, second homes. To cut a long story short, we eventually managed so far to build 11 uh, properties on the island, which we let the local island people. Like more houses for affordable houses here. Get more families, because there's a school here that has three kids, nearly four kids in it now, nearly, um, soon. I just haven't got enough. Everybody's getting older and not reproducing. <laughs> so it'd be nice to whether build or acquire the houses that come up for sale and keep them at low cost. I'm off to meet someone now who, although he doesn't live on the island, he has a very special connection with the fishing community here. Uh, Eddie, Eddie Douglas, who's a fisherman on the island and is also part of the air ambulance crew, uh, he came out and had a chat with me. And then Robin Henderson came out to the lifeboat house. Uh, he was also there. He's from the Isle of Nye. Uh, he was the bird warden at the time, uh, very knowledgeable on birds. and started teaching me how to recognise birds. And as we walked around the village, he would point out different aspects uh, and things like that, and we just we just got gelled off really, and and, and become friends. Uh, so that really started it off. And then this particular day, uh, he come with Robin uh, and knocked on the door. He said they had a fishing boat. It was a, the largest fishing boat they'd had. Um, they wanted it signed. It has to be signed written. Uh, asked to have a name and it also asked to have the home office numbers on it was 153 they couldn't get a sign writer from the mainland there was none available and the tides made it very very awkward uh, I said would I do it sorry to disturb my holiday I said that's alright I didn't mind that I had time to go back and get all my gear and he says well what do you need and I said well I'll need a pallet and explain what an artist pallet was like with a thing to put your thumb through and some dippers. He, he made them out of uh, bottle tops. Uh, he, he made a little hole for me, which is a bit nearly like splinters, but it, I managed. And, it, and it, I think he sewed a broom handle up for the round stick for the mile stick, which is a bit, with a bit of thing on the top. Well, I wrote flowing tide on. We were on a, a trestle uh, built up and it was a bit wobbly. And, and a bit only because only just reach, and I got off a pair of wobbly steps. Uh, the paint wasn't sign writing paint, it was out of big gallon tins all spilt down the sides. And he, uh, I put flowing tide on, and then I put the shading on, and then I, I coated it up again. They offered to pay me for doing it, and I says, No, no, I don't want to. It's just a privilege to put something back into the island that we loved and have visited so many times. So very much like Madeline and her brother Leo, Neville and his wife Brenda's hearts certainly are ingrained on this island.
Now, when you mention Holy Island, music isn't going to be the first thing that pops into your mind. But if you were asked to think of music connected with Holy Island, I guarantee you'd think of world-famous band Lindisfarne. Well, today I've come along to meet with the founder member of Lindisfarne, Ray Laidlaw. Ray, how Hiya. are you? I'm very well. But how did the name come about? I mean, how that came about was we had to change the name from Brethren because it was an American band called ah, Brethren okay. we didn't know about. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about visiting up here and a guy called John Anthony, who was mm -hmm. routining stuff for the first album, mm -hmm. heard us mention Lindisfarne and he said, that would be a great name. Great name. Uh, and we thought, well, maybe. You know, but we wanted something regional. We didn't want something... Because we, mm -hmm. we knew we were a different sort of band to most of what was going on. Yeah. It was mostly metal bands in that at the time. So anyway, we, uh, we liked the idea and it stuck. And then consequently, we ended up coming up here lots and lots for film shoots and photograph sessions and everything. So we're, an affinity with the place just grew from that. But uh, the affinity, I mean, at first, you know, I wouldn't have been surprised if some of the locals had been a bit miffed, you know, that would pinch their name. Mm. But it was anything but. I mean, they were really Embraced welcoming. It. And, of course, it was a lot quieter in those days, in the early 70s. It wasn't just the people up here right. that you get now. Yes. But yeah. we made friends with um, with the landlord and landlady mm -hmm. of the Northumberland Arms, mm -hmm. Olive and Norman Luke. Uh, and they made us really welcome. We're, on one occasion, we came up to make a film up here. And us and the crew, the entire film crew, stayed in the pub for about a week. Yeah. It was... Uh, one of those uh, really foggy weeks, you know, so mm -hmm. we, we spent most of the time in the bar playing dominoes and we made the whole film on the last day when the sun came out. Is that one you of know? your fondest memories? Oh, yes. Yeah. And, now, and now I'm really good friends with Olive's granddaughter and grandson, you yeah. know, who are still here, you know, so yeah. it's, it's, it goes on. It is, it is a very, very special place to be um, because we get to meet people from all over the world, including you guys, so it's a, a real privilege to encounter people um, on their journeys in, in all sorts of ways, and to also hold a very small community of people who still live here. There's only about 140 of us, so um, that is quite lovely to, to have that sort of small community, and then thousands of visitors, yeah, and it is a very special place to be, yeah. When Aidan and Cuthbert lived on this Northumbrian coast with all of its wildness and solitude and isolation, they knew that God was here. But what does that mean for Holy Islanders today? What have those ancient saints got to say to the Holy Island population in their modern day lives? Perhaps the answer is simple. Look around. He's still here. Alone and isolated when the tide is in, islanders rely solely on each other for help and support. But when the tide is out, they can again count on the general mainland population for support. Along the quayside at Berwick, I spoke to one of the many business owners on the mainland about ties with the island. Yeah, we, we do a lot with the island, um, really well supported by the island. Um, we'll try and give them as much support as we can and they give, in turn give us the, you know, what we need back as well, so it works well. So what challenges do islanders face on a daily basis? Create a few jobs, and we've we'll got some younger people, families here maybe, and um, which would link in with our development trust housing schemes that we've got, and we're trying to add more houses, so we could maybe get younger people here to, to work, to have children, the school, keep the school going, because the, the school, is, is, we haven't only got a handful of pupils there. As with all communities, children and young people play a major role in the future of the island. This small school nestled away in this corner looks as charming as any other village primary school. But how does this school compare to those on the mainland? It's locked. So where have all the children gone? That's a nice close community. There's only 30 at Lowick, two from here. 
I think when they're nine year old, they go away to boarding school through the week, come home at weekends. I think they do they do a great job. I have a couple of young babies in the community that are due to follow on in the school, so it'll never be empty at the moment. But I don't know what will happen after that. I don't think we've got enough young ones to carry that on. And I'm possibly see the day when the school might have to close because we haven't enough pupils. It did that a few years ago, when, but now we've got a few again. But it did close for a brief period a few years ago. But I think they've kept it, reopened it when kids came available, so it'll probably happen again. So hopefully that's the way. And maybe some sort of light industry or some sort of <sighs> producing, making something that would uh, encourage people maybe to come here and live and work and make a success of their lives. Something that would create jobs that would be 52-week-a-year jobs rather than sort of tourist-related jobs because the tourist jobs are sort of seasonal and maybe something like a light industry, a little unit or something just to create a few jobs. Listening to Peter, I wondered if a vehicle repair shop would be viable on the island. No, I'd, find, I'd think it would be very difficult to survive on the island just with the way the tides are and tourists don't want to stay on the island if you were doing their cars. You'd, it just wouldn't work in the time frame that you have for the, the way the tides are, you know. So I know the, the, the locals would try and support it, but I don't think there would be a need for a garage, you know, just the logistics of it more than anything else. No, we don't have many people travel uh, for work, one or two only. Got quite a few uh, travel the other way from the mainland onto the island to work, at, but it's all tourist-related. Um, which goes back to it would be nice to have people living on the island and working on the island. And we've got Daniel Richardson who met a young girl on the island and he's actually moved on to the island and he's a fisherman there. Um, and, uh, you know, he loves it. He loves the island and very proud to know him as well. So. With actual photographs. Yeah. Taken here this on the, the island. Pulling the train album, folks. Yep. And in here. Yep. All the interior photographs. Ah, goodness, all taken on the island in 1971. Yep. That's when I had hair. That's when you had hair. Yes. And is this the one you said that had to move the the yeah, bench yeah. or something from outside the Britannia yeah. Guest House? That's become um, a bit like the Beatles Abbey Road uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, photograph, where people recreate it. So you get. <laughs> Even now, you get people coming up here and recreating that photograph and doing it for themselves and taking it away, which is lovely. That's it's a nice fantastic. thing to happen. Yeah. You know, it's, a, it's, a bit of, it's gone into folklore. That is great. That's fantastic. Thanks so much for bringing that along. It's all right. And there's Olive, lovely old Olive, Luke. Ah, oh, this is the lady you were mentioning before, Olive. Yeah. 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 Her granddaughter works in the post office. Is there any other places on the island that you... That you're really drawn to, that you really it's enjoy. All, it's all magic. All. I, to be honest with you, I love it in the middle of winter. Yeah. When it's windy and cold and bleak and magical. And you can go across to the beaches on the other side, you know, and it's just got... Mm -hmm. The place has got something about it. Mm -hmm. It's steeped in history. And do you, when you're out and about on Holy Island, you nearly always get spotted by people as well. Not these days, because I've got no hair, man. Oh, well... They don't yeah. spot it, no. <laughs> Put a wig on and then... What do, you, what do you make of today's music? Is there anything that you would... A band out there that you would think was similar to Lindisfarne, or there's lots of good bands about and lots of good performers, like there always has. And you know, in the words of the great Frank Zappa, there's only two sorts of music: there's good music and bad music. Um, I like uh, the Pastures right. from Tyneside. I like Sunset Suns. Um, in terms of solo artists, uh, who do I like? Elle Devine, she's great. Ooh, of course, the wonderful Sam Fender from North yeah, Shields. Yeah. You know, my young Sam. Yeah. Known him for years, he's great. Yeah. Uh, and lots of good. There's always good stuff around you, so sometimes you've got to make the effort to look. So, what's happening What's happening now? What's in the pipeline, music-wise? Well, well, I left uh, Lindisfarne in 2003 when that version of the band quit mm -hmm. and didn't do much to do with Lindisfarne for a while, but then kept getting asked to get involved and asked to get involved. So Billy Mitchell and I, another ex-member, we put a show together called The Lindisfarne Story, which basically does what it says on the tin. It tells the story of the band mm -hmm. from the beginning, and but we'll, every time we tour it, we'll have a slightly different angle to it. Yeah. And this year, the 2022 version is the story of uh, this album 
because it's 50 years since this album came out. The show's called The Lindisfarne Story, 50 Years of Fog. 50 Years of Fog. And we've been touring that in the spring, and now we're taking it out again in November around other places again. That's another thing. During this pandemic, I've got to the stage where I don't never know what day it is. <laughs> to begin with, first couple of weeks, it was dead. But then, because of Tully Island, it just went about like nobody nobody came here. It was like a ghost town, so everybody that lived here could go around. If that makes sense. Yeah. Well, even though you wasn't allowed. <laughs> but it was really nice. Two years of bliss. <laughs> I think that's why we don't like it so much now, because we got used to that. We didn't have any COVID here through the whole thing until now. And it's went through the whole village <laughs> in the last month or two. A lot of visitors, every, well, in the summer, now Easter onwards. It's, you'll not notice it today, but yesterday was even. <laughs> In the summer months, a six-week summer or school holidays, there's a bus every day from Berwick and picks up from the A1 turn off. And you can, but it's only once the island and then obviously home again. So it's, but having said that, I don't think anyone, there's not very locals, regular residents that actually use it when it does run. This window here on Wild Linders Farm certainly gives the visitor a unique and fantastic view of all the wild birds that visit this island. Established just a few years ago, the stone-built centre informs the traveller about the vast array of wildlife on the island. I mean, I have lots of old friends who come and sit and talk to me about the days when they used to walk to the dunes, but they don't do it anymore. I've not been up the dunes myself for about five years, but I still know every blade of grass that there is up there, mm -hmm. and I'm hopeful that it's not being spoiled. People come back and tell me that one or two things have changed, but not too badly. Yeah. like the peace and the quiet and and there's no need for antagonism between people between nations I don't know how we set about sorting it all out obviously the modern wars and things that are going on that's quite sad uh, Hopefully in one day these will come to an end and this Russian thing, Putin thing, it's like quite saddens everyone, this I think. On a beautiful summer's day, the Grove School from Berwick upon Tweed pay a visit to the island. It's the culmination of months of study and research into the history and heritage of Lindisfarne.
It's May time and I'm back on Holy Island and I've come across Angela Noble today who is a tribal belly dancer. Angela absolutely loves Holy Island. Angela, would you like to tell us what it is about Holy Island that you really love? As a child, my parents brought me here for day trips. Um, my father gave me a book, Dragon Under the Hill, mm -hmm. by Gordon Honeycomb, which is set on the island. The, the connections with the Vikings and myths and legends, mm -hmm. and that got my imagination going. And then the school brought us here, mm -hmm. and we stayed in the hostel. And to stay on the island overnight with the tide coming in, for a young mind that was just wonderful and we wrote poetry as part of an English project and it just all through life since then mm -hmm. I've been drawn back and we come as often as we can having brought my children here to play on the beach and collect sea glass and um, cuthbert beads and I things. need to find some of these cuthbert beads. What are they cuthbert beads? What yeah. are they? Tell us what they are. Because They're I've yet to fossils. Find them. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's plant stalks, crinoids, I think is the technical term for yeah. them. Little r cylindrical uh, sections through a plant stalk. And mm -hmm. they sometimes you're lucky and find the holes, but they get they come from like a couple of millimetres right. up to about a centimetre. Wow. So you get your eye what in. What colour are they? They're just brown or uh, something? Or? Yeah, sort yeah. of a, a beigey, greeny brown. I hope so, but this beach. Yeah. And the story goes that Cuthbert made his rosary from those wow. old, these prayer beads. So. We need to find some yeah. today. Yeah. I know you're going to be doing a bit of dancing later, so you might find some, but. We'll have a look. say this is probably your favourite place to be outdoors belly dancing or it's up there with some of your favourite places? Certainly. Yeah. Uh, we've been doing projects during lockdown when we couldn't dance indoors. Mm. We've been going around different places mm. in Northumberland and this was one of our favourite places to come to. And then yeah. on the, the Pilgrim's Way mm -hmm. we, we stood over there mm -hmm. and danced. 
From far and wide, pilgrims gather on the causeway to trek across to the island, barefoot, carrying beautifully made crosses. Oh, it's marvellous. Marvellous. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful countryside. Place. We drove up yesterday. And, yeah. Beautiful. We, we, did the, we did the coast run and uh, up to Bamba Castle and uh, it was quite special, yeah. Well, for me, it's kind of personal, yeah. It's something I haven't done before, and I've, I meant to do it. I've, I've, I've read a bit about, you know, the, the pilgrimers and the pilgrimage and uh, the pilgrims, I should say. And I thought, hmm, that'd be pretty good to do, just to have a bit of uh, um, spirit going. <laughs> make, make Easter special. People joined together in Christian celebration, reflecting the true spirituality of this majestic island, Lindisfarne. Ah, uh, we've come up from Leicestershire, and uh, yeah, we've been up in the area before, but we've never done this particular walk, a pilgrimage across. So. The first time I, I came here was several years ago, quite a few years ago, and it just bowled me over. It, it, it it's just something you don't find anywhere really and, and I've been a few places so uh, yeah it's very very special as the warm mists encircle the island people gather for the annual pilgrimage across the sands it's Good Friday Then Dave and Alice set off across the misty sands. Following the line of poles, the pilgrims disappear into the quiet mist. During our time looking at the island and surrounding area, we were joined by French student Mayanne. Bonjour. <laughs> Euh, parce que je voulais améliorer mon anglais. Je suis venue ici pour découvrir aussi la culture de, de l'Angleterre et du Royaume-Uni. J'habite à Ruffec, près de Bordeaux, en France. J'habite chez des amis qui, qui viennent en France, qui s'appellent David et Colette. Here to study language, Mayanne stayed with a couple in Berwick and soon found herself immersed in the history of North Northumberland by visiting one of the many local heritage groups in the area. Studying many photographs and ancient maps of this rugged coastline, Mayanne soon discovered the wealth of history associated with the Kingdom of Northumbria. Je suis venue ici pour euh, donc améliorer mon anglais parce que je veux faire des études de tourisme euh, plus tard. But what impression does Mayan have of Holy Island? Donc être dans l'aéronautique, euh, je trouve qu'elle est très jolie. Les personnes ici sont très accueillantes aussi. Euh, la vue aussi sur euh, sur l'île et sur euh, la plage est très jolie aussi. Je trouve ça très intéressant de changer de culture, changer d'environnement aussi et vraiment de hum, de venir vraiment dans le pays pour apprendre la langue. Looking like matchstick figures from an L.S. Lowry painting, the pilgrims pass in and out of the mists on their quiet journey of contemplation. Mm -hmm. 
only to reappear into the beautiful sunshine on the island side. Thousands of people a year walk when the tide is right. You have to get the right tide. And there's a very muddy place in the middle, really, really muddy, where you kind of sink and you might lose your shoes and your, your wellingtons. But if you take your shoes off, most people take their shoes off right at the beginning. A, because they like to feel the sand and they like to feel the water. But also it means that when you, when you put your feet out, your, your toes go out and you don't sink so far. We joined Angela in an impromptu dance workshop on the sands. Oh, I wonder, could we perhaps join in with you to see what it's like? Of course, yes. Excellent. energy of the place. Right. What would you describe, what does the energy feel like to you here on Holy Island? Well, the first word that springs to mind is magical. There's a, not many places that I get that feeling, but this is one and you of them. Feel it, it feels here. it here. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And I can use that to dance. Walking around on the island, I've noticed that the islanders here seem to keep themselves to themselves. They appear to have a can-do mentality. They have to. When the tide comes in, they may as well be 30 miles out into the North Sea instead of just three. A few, I can't remember how many years ago it was, when we got snowed in. And the snow was as high as the hedges at Beal. Couldn't get out for a, a week, I think, before it got cleared. And we had cancer patient here, what it needed to get to the appointment and things. and. It brought out a lot of community spirit, to be honest. Everybody was sharing food and bread and milk and emptying your freezers kind of thing. It was it was nice, but at the same time, hard. <laughs> we get a lot of power cuts here with the weather. Fortunately, that time it stayed on. We really, really do care about each other. I think because there's not so many of us, we keep an eye out for each other and um, there are always people you can ask for help. So it is a very, very special place. It's just like a very big family, really. Yeah, very special place to be. Don't let the whole island go like Beamish, because it's heading that way now. And try and keep families here. Keep it going as Holy Island with residents, because soon I don't think it will be anymore, which is quite sad. the ebb and flow of the tides along the North Northumberland coast comes a very special hazard, the Holy Island Causeway. One of the things amongst quite a few things Holy Island is famous for is the tides and motorists being caught out by them. 
and motorists have indeed been caught out by the tides for many years on this relatively short piece of road. Warning signs, time and tide tables have all contributed and offered advice to the unsuspecting motorist, but still, some are caught out. The, 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 the cars are totaled right off once it's been in because it's salt water, so it gets into the electrics. But just the, the force of the water, it just kind of washes the car to the side, so it, it's, it's, it's beyond repair. But they get a lot of call out to the causeway, visitors getting stuck. It's nice to help them. The island's more than aware of what goes on and it's frustrating for all parties involved when it is another recovery from there. So is there another solution? One of the problems of having a barrier is that actually it would rust really, really quickly. So um, it could get stuck down and it might get stuck up. And if it stays up, people might decide to drive into the water even though they can see the water because the barrier is up. So it really isn't a safe sort of option. So telling people and reminding people that they shouldn't drive into water is really the safest, the safest thing. That's where the schools came up with some very novel ideas, all part of some innovation workshops. <laughs> <laughs> I asked the teaching staff how the series of workshops had went. It has been absolutely amazing. You never know what you're going to get when you book this kind of activity and it has been amazing. The children have thoroughly enjoyed it. The self-confidence and the self-esteem has grown so much and they are so enthusiastic and motivated, it's amazing. We try to make sure that our curriculum is based fairly locally. One of the themes is going to be all uh, the world around us and part of that is going to be looking at the history of Holy Island and Lindisfarne. They came over a lot more relaxed because, and they were able to just think about what they did, what the problems were, and how they collaborated together to solve the problems. It's really important for our children to understand their local history as well as a broader, wider look at history, geography, and all those elements of the curriculum. Yeah. All the workshops were held as a tribute and in memory of one person. Madeline Kinlan. They got the um, information from yourself in their first session and they learnt a little bit about her and her history and her connection to, to Holy Island. They really, really enjoyed them. Enthusiastically looking for solutions and some interesting ideas. Um, some of the young people have some really far out ideas and some of the other children it was a bit more uh, doable, I would say. I think it's been amazing. I think it's reached every aspect of enjoyment that the children could have had. I think they have really enjoyed it. They've totally engaged. They've learned so much about problem solving and overcoming that ghastly feeling of when you're going to be filmed. And I think most of them now say to me, when I'm going to be filmed, I'm going to do something. I'm going to move my hands or do something. It's easier to talk. And I think that's great. One of their last topics with their previous teacher, who is actually the head teacher, was all about Lindisfarne. We did some uh, music workshops. We did some drama workshops um, and all the children were really engrossed in the activities that we were doing so they really thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, but yeah, they really enjoyed it and seeing them constructing their models in the, in the hall was lovely, really, really nice. And then taking those models home was, was great for the children as well, having that end product of what they had 
done, but they really enjoyed it. The real islanders are lovely people. They're very caring, they're very supportive, but they're very, it probably fits for an island, they're very insular. Uh, they like to keep themselves to themselves and not in, be interfered with or interfere in each other's lives except to support. During the summer, a proposed plan was drawn up to make the area around the island a highly protected marine area. This would signal the end of fishing on the island. Which will result in hardship for many families and businesses on the island. See the lifeboat house from here as well. That's going to be my next stop. Up and down these coastal communities, the lifeboat plays a major role in keeping the seabound mariner safe. This lifeboat house here is perched very close to the beach, but when the tide is out, the sea can be a very, very long way away. Of course, this lifeboat house is no longer home to a lifeboat. It's now used to put on local exhibitions. Something that Linda Bankia explained to the students during one of her history archive sessions at the Grove School in Berwick. Well, the lifeboat did used to be on wheels because it had to be pulled out of the lifeboat station. And I think when you're over, if you go down to the old lifeboat station, it's still there. And this is how they used to work the lifeboat. So they'd have to pull it out of the station and then put it onto the sand, pull it along the sand. Now, what are they using to pull it along there? Horses. They're using horses. horses. But sometimes they couldn't use the horses, so the men and everyone had to pull the lifeboat. In the Lindisfarne Centre, I looked in on a weaving space. The small exhibition is one of the many that may spring up on the island. Sadly, this week in September saw the sad loss of our Queen Elizabeth. We wish her son and heir, King Charles, much love and support as our new monarch.
So something I've been really keen to find out about is traditions and superstitions on Holy Island, which has led me down here to the beautiful St. Mary's Church. So just outside the church, you can find this. This is the petting stone. It's a lovely tradition. The newlywed bride would be helped over the stone by a fisherman and this would bring lots of good luck and happiness to the marriage. Meanwhile, back at the Grove School over on the mainland. So weddings on Holy Island are slightly different because they've got these different traditions that we don't have. To get out of the church gates, they have to pay the fishermen. All the men on the island who've got a shotgun license, they fire the shotguns. Yep. They break a plate over the bride's head. And this is meant to be good luck. You have to be an islander to be married at the church on the island. Well, that's another couple off to start a brand new, exciting chapter of their lives together. A bit like my last 12 months, looking at different aspects, the people and chapters of this very special island. As in most small communities, it's the people who create the energy and dynamic soul of the place. Well, coupled with that, this has to be one of the most precious places in the world. Why do people feel drawn to this piece of Northumbria? Just a piece of land jutting out into the cold North Sea. Sometimes blustery, cold, sometimes bleak. Kept apart twice a day from the mainland by totally natural forces. Difficult to get to except for a strip of tarmac two cars wide or a sandy trek across the sands. But then, most worthwhile journeys require care and persistence. And the reward? Well, that speaks for itself. How many Newcastle supporter? How long you support of Newcastle? Sported in Newcastle since I was a boy. And um, my dad was a great supporter in Newcastle United. And my dad actually organised, well, him and some of his friends organised Newcastle. And we had Joe Harvey, Bobby Mitchell, Frank Brennan, etc. And they brought the cup to the island, the FA Cup. I think that I, I, I had a drink from it, it was lemonade mine. Um, and the, they brought the, the cup, the FA Cup of the island, and uh, took it round. And, um, and that would be probably 52 or 53 when they won the, won the, won the cup in 52. I think that was probably, because I can just remember, I was, uh, I was maybe about 10 year old or something. Yeah.